Chapter 1. Causes Leading to the Crusades, Part 1. The Crusades were a series of wars waged by men who wore on their garments the badge of the cross as a pledge binding them to rescue the Holy Land and the Sepulchre of Christ from the grasp of the unbeliever. The dream of such an enterprise had long floated before the minds of keen-sighted popes and passionate enthusiasts. It was realized for the first time when, after listening to the burning eloquence of Urban II at the Council of Clermont, the assembled multitude with one voice welcomed the sacred war as the will of God, November 1095. If we regard this undertaking as the simple expression of popular feeling, stirred to its inmost depths, we may ascribe to the struggle to which they thus committed themselves a character wholly unlike that of any earlier wars waged in Christendom, or by the powers of Christendom against enemies who lay beyond its pale. Statesmen, whether popes, kings, or dukes, might have availed themselves eagerly of the overwhelming impulse imparted by the preaching of Peter the Hermit, to passions long pent up. But no authority of pope, emperor, or king could suffice of itself to open the floodgates for the waters which might sweep away the infidel. In this sense only were men stirred, whether at the Council of Piacenza in 1094, or in that of Clermont, to a strife of a wholly new kind. If Urban II gave his blessing to the missionaries who were to convert the Saracens at the point of the sword, the papal benediction had been given nearly thirty years before at the instigation of Hildebrand in 1066 to the expedition by which the Norman William hoped to crush the free English people and usurp the throne of the king whom they had chosen. But the movement of the Norman duke against England was merely the work of a sovereign well awake to his own interest and confident in the methods by which he chose to promote it. Under the sacred standard sent to him by Pope Alexander II, he gathered indeed a motley host of adventurers. But the religious enthusiasm by which these may have fancied themselves to be animated had reference chiefly to the broad acres to which they looked forward as their recompense. The great gulf which separated such an undertaking from the crusade of the hermit Peter lay in the conviction, deep even to fanaticism, that the wearers of the cross had before them an enterprise in which failure, disaster, and death were not less blessed nor less objects of envy and longing than the most brilliant conquests and the most splendid triumphs. They were hastening to the land where their divine master had descended from his throne in heaven to take on himself the form of man, where for years the everlasting Son of the Almighty Father had patiently toiled, healing the sick, comforting the afflicted, and raising the dead, until at length he carried his own cross up the height of Calvary, and having offered up his perfect sacrifice, put off the garments of his humiliation when the earthquake shattered the prison-house of his sepulchre. For them, the whole land had been rendered holy by the tread of his sacred feet, and the pilgrim who had traced the scenes of his life from his cradle at Bethlehem to the spot of his ascent from Olivet might sing the Nunc Dimittis as having with his own eyes seen the divine salvation. Thus the crusade preached by Peter the Hermit, and solemnly sanctioned by Pope Urban, was rendered possible by the combination of papal authority with an irresistible popular conviction. That papal authority was the necessary result of the old imperial tradition of Rome. The popular conviction was the growth of a tendency which had characterized every religion professed by Aryan or Semitic nations, and both these causes were wholly unconnected with the teaching of Christ, and of his disciples, as it is set before us in the New Testament. Far from ascribing special sanctity to any one spot over another, the emphatic declaration that the hour was come to which men should worship the Father, not merely in Jerusalem or on the Samaritan mountain, proclaimed a gospel which taught that all men, in all places, are alike near to God, in whom they live, move, and have their being. If we turn to the narrative which relates the Acts of the Apostles, we shall find not a sign of the feeling which regards Bethlehem, Jerusalem, or Nazareth, the Sea of Galilee, 
or the banks of Jordan as places which of themselves should awaken any enthusiastic or passionate feeling. The thoughts of the disciples, if we confine ourselves to this record, were absorbed with more immediate and momentous concerns. Before their generation should pass away, the Son of Man would return to judgment, and the dead should be summoned from their graves to his awful tribunal. Hence any vehement longing for one spot on earth over another was wretchedly out of place for those who held that the time was short, and that it behooved those who had wives to be as though they had none, those that bought as though they possessed not, and those that wept and rejoiced as though they wept and rejoiced not. Nay, more with a feeling more approaching to impatience, the great apostle of the Gentiles could put aside the yearnings of a weaker sentiment, and declare that although he had known Christ in the flesh, yet henceforth he would so know him no more. The image, therefore, of the great founder of Christianity was for him purely spiritual. In the letters which he wrote to the churches, formed by his converts, there is not a sign that the thought or the sight of Bethlehem or Nazareth would awaken in him any deeper feeling than places wholly destitute of historical associations. If he speaks of Jerusalem, he never implies that it had for him any special sanctity. His mission was to preach a faith altogether independent of time and place, and not only not needing, but even rejecting the sensuous aid afforded by visible memorials of the master whom he loved. Such was the Christianity of St. Paul, and with such weapons it went forth to assail and throw down the strongholds of heathenism. Three centuries later we behold Christianity dominant as the religion of the Roman Empire, but in its outward aspect and in its practical working it has undergone a vast and significant change. It cannot be supposed that this change was wrought at once by the mere fact of its recognition by the temporal power. The endless debates which fill the history of early Christianity on the relations of the persons of the Trinity and on the mystery of the Incarnation may in some degree have helped to fix the minds of men on the land where the Saviour had lived and on the several scenes of his ministry, but this alone would never have sufficed to work the revolution which Christianity has manifestly undergone, even before we reach the age of Constantine. The victory won over heathenism, if not merely nominal, was at best partial. The religion of the empire knew nothing of the one eternal God, who demands from all men a spontaneous submission to his righteous law, and bids them find their highest good in his divine love. That religion rested on the might of the Capitoline Jupiter, and the visible majesty of the emperor. But the real influences which were at work from the first to modify the Christianity of St. Paul lay in the lower strata of society, in the modes of thought and feeling prevalent among the masses who furnished the converts of the first two or three centuries. In these converts we cannot doubt that there was wrought a real change, a change manifest chiefly in the conviction that the divine law is binding on all, and that the state of things in the Roman world was unspeakably shameful. In the Jesus whom Paul preached, they beheld the righteous teacher, who condemned the iniquities of godless rulers and a corrupt people, the avenger of their unjust deeds, the loving redeemer, in whose arms the weary and heavy laden might find rest, the awful judge, who should be seen at the end of the world on his great white throne, with all the kindreds of mankind waiting their doom before him. The personal human love thus kindled in them turned only into a different channel thoughts and feelings which it would need centuries to root out. These thoughts and feelings had been fed by that tendency to localize incidents in the supposed history of gods or heroes which is the most prominent characteristic of all heathen religions, and of the vast crowd of these heathen religions or superstitions, there was, if we may trust the statements of Roman writers, scarcely one which had not its adherents and votaries at Rome. Here were gathered the priests and worshippers of the Egyptian Isis, the virgin mother of Osiris, the god who rose again after his crucifixion, to gladden the earth with his splendor, here might be seen the adorers of the Persian sun-god Mithras, 
born at the winter solstice and growing in strength until he wins his victory over the powers of darkness after the vernal equinox but this idea of the death and resurrection of the lord of light was no new importation brought in by the theology of egypt or persia the story of the egyptian osiris was repeated in the greek stories of sarpedon and memnon of tithonus and asclepius Aesclepius, of the teutonic balder and woden odin the birthplace of these deities the scenes associated with their traditional exploits became holy spots each with its own consecrating legends and not a few attracting to themselves vast gatherings of pilgrims. It was not wonderful, therefore, that the worshippers of these and other like gods should, on professing the faith of Christ, carry with them all that they could retain of their old belief without utterly contradicting the new, that his nativity should be celebrated at the time when the sun begins to rise in the heavens, and his resurrection when the victory of light over darkness is achieved in the spring the worshipper of the egyptian amun the ram carried his old associations with him when he became a follower of the lamb of god and the burst of light which heralded the return of the maiden to the mourning mother in the greek mysteries of eleusis was reproduced in a miracle still repeated year by year by the patriarch of jerusalem when he announces the descent of the sacred fire in the sepulchre of christ thus for the christians of the third century if not of the second, Judea or Palestine became a holy land, and with the growth of devotion to the human person of Christ grew the feeling of reverence for every place which he had visited and every memorial which he had left behind him. The impulse once given soon becomes irresistible. Every incident of the gospel narratives was associated with some particular spot and the certainty of the verification was never questioned by the thousands who felt that the sight of these places brought them nearer to heaven and was in itself a purification of their souls they could follow the redeemer from the cave in which he was born and where the wise men of the east laid before him their royal offerings to the mount from which he uttered his blessings on the pure the merciful and the peacemakers and thence to the other mount on which he offered his perfect sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. The spots associated with his passion, his burial, and his resurrection called forth emotions of passionate veneration, which were intensified by the alleged discovery of the cross on which he had suffered, together with the two crosses on which the thieves had been condemned to die. If the presence of the tablet containing the title inscribed by Pontius Pilate still left it uncertain to which of the crosses that tablet belonged and to which therefore the homage of the faithful should be paid all doubt was removed when a woman at the point of death on whom the touch of two of these crosses had no effect was restored to strength and youth by the touch of the third the splendid churches raised by the devout zeal of constantine and his mother helena over the cave at bethlehem and the sepulchre at jerusalem became for the christians that which the sacred stone at Mecca and the tomb of the prophet at Medina became afterwards for the followers of Islam. Nor can we be surprised if the emperor whose previous life had been marked by special devotion to the Greek and Roman sun-god transferred the characteristics of Apollon, Apollo, to the meek and merciful Jesus, whose teaching to the last he utterly misapprehended. The purpose which drew to Palestine the long lines of pilgrims, which each year increased in numbers, was not the mere aimless love of wandering, which is supposed to furnish the motive for Tartar pilgrimages in our own as in former ages. The Aryan, so far as we know, was never a nomadic race, but we can understand the eagerness even of a stationary population to undertake a long and dangerous journey if the mere making of it should ensure the remission of their sins. Nothing less than this was the pilgrim led to expect, who had traversed land and sea to bathe in the Jordan and offer up his prayers at the birthplace and tomb of his master. A few men of keener discernment and wider culture might see the mischiefs lurking in this belief and protest against the superstition. Augustine, the great doctor whose confessions have made his name familiar to thousands, who knew nothing of his life or teaching, 
might bid Christians remember that righteousness was not to be sought in the East, nor mercy in the West, and that voyages were useless to carry us to him, with whom a hearty faith makes us immediately present. In these protests he might be upheld by men like Gregory of Nyssa and Jerome. But Jerome, while he dwelt on the uselessness of pilgrimage, and the absurdity of supposing that prayers offered in one place could be more acceptable than the same prayers offered in another, took up his abode in a cave at Bethlehem, and there discoursed to Roman ladies who had crossed the sea to listen to his splendid eloquence. Heaven, he insisted, was as accessible from Britain as from Palestine, but his actions contradicted his words, and his example exercised a more potent influence than his precept. The purely spiritual faith on which Jerome laid stress was as much beyond the spirit of the age as the moral feelings of a later age were behind those of the woman who, in the crusade of St. Louis, was seen carrying in her right hand a porringer of fire and in her left a bottle of water. With the fire she wished, as Joinville tells us, to burn paradise, with the water to drown hell, so that none might do good for the reward of the one, nor avoid evil from fear of the other, since every good ought to be done from the perfect and sincere love which man owes to his Creator, who is the supreme good. Such a tone of thought was in ludicrous discord with the temper which brought Jerome himself to Bethlehem, and which soon began to fill the land with those who had nothing of Jerome's culture, and the sobriety which, in whatever degree, must spring from it. End of section 1